Well, Stuart, thank you for that, uh, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, we um, are celebrating this year the 60th anniversary of uh, Sputnik. Uh, this is a display I visited uh, last month at the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency headquarters in Vienna, where I was um, uh, convening a working group on uh, iron beam physics for the quantum era. And it had a very nice display. Uh, and the reason why this is so important is this is the first time uh, an object uh, was put into orbit around the Earth. And this, I have to say, had a galvanising effect on uh, the nations of the Earth, particularly uh, the United States, who had in mind being the first, but was moving at a very leisurely pace. And uh, I was just talking to one of our distinguished alumni uh, here uh, this evening. Uh, this triggered a revolution in the way physics was taught, because the Americans realised they were uh, not producing enough adequately trained physicists and it triggered the, a revolution, uh, the PSSC physics program, uh, which indeed uh, I uh, uh, had when I was uh, at school way back in the early 70s, a direct consequence uh, of the uh, upskilling uh, from the Americans for the, uh, the school system in the US and consequently here in Australia. So this is a very significant uh, anniversary and I thought it was time we looked at uh, uh, space in, uh, on the 60th uh, anniversary. So I want to uh, talk about uh, the prospects for fast tr uh, trips to the stars. This is, uh, of course, a serious physics lecture. Uh, so there's nothing wrong in this lecture. There's no science fiction. However, from time to time, I'm obliged to uh, put up some stuff which is wrong. And you'll see uh, when I do that, I need to correct a number of errors that have crept in uh, mostly in Hollywood. So I'm going to touch on uh, special, the special theory of relativity. I'm going to speculate whether human space travel is possible between the stars. And as I mentioned, I'll have occasion to touch on some of the methods from science fiction and consider uh, if they're possible. So here you'll notice uh, the red screen of warning. When you see a red border around the screen, you'll know that something funny is going on and it's probably not... Oh. Probably not true, all right? So if it doesn't have a red border around it, the physics is sound. If it does have a red border around it, be careful. So as you know, I'm a great fan of Galileo, so let me begin uh, with Galileo. How do we know how far away the stars are? And this was a problem that Galileo applied himself. Uh, first of all, he wanted to know how far away the stars were, but he also wanted to uh, provide objective proof that the Earth orbits around the Sun and not the other way around. He wanted to show the Earth is not fixed at rest in the centre of the universe, that it actually moves, it orbits. And the way he thought he would do that is he would look at two nearby stars. This is the Mizar double star and here are the trapezium stars. These are observations of the trapezium stars from Galileo's notebooks. Uh, down here is an actual photograph. And here, if I superimpose the actual photo on top of Galileo's notes, you see he was a very accurate observer through his uh, astronomical telescope. Fantastic uh, detail and accuracy. So the reason, uh, if we turn to his observations of the Mizar double star system, what he had in mind was um, to work out how far away these stars were, assuming they were just like the sun. So you know how big the sun is in the sky and he knew roughly how far away the sun was. So by looking through his telescope and measuring the diameter of these two stars, he could work out how far away they were. That was his reasoning. And when he did that, given how big they appeared in the eyepiece of his telescope, he calculated they were between 300 and 400 astronomical units, units distant from the Earth. And an astronomical unit is just the distance from the Sun to the Earth, the radius of the Earth's orbit. Now, what Galileo wanted then to do was to observe these two stars, calculated to be these distances apart, over the course of a year. And during a year, the Earth would move to one extreme around the Sun and back again across two astronomical units, the diameter of the Earth's orbit. And when you do that, I observe the nearby people down here are moving backwards and forwards relative to the people who are further away. <coughs> this is parallax. So what Galileo expected to see on the basis of his 
observed and calculated distances was the nearby star, the big one, moved backwards and forwards relative to the small one which he deduced was more further distant, parallax. And despite years of very careful observation, he never saw any stellar parallax. The two stars stayed stubbornly in the same orientation with respect to each other over the course of a year. Strangely, Galileo never published this null result because it would have contradicted the heliocentric model of the solar system. But I guess he was smart enough to know he must have done something wrong. And indeed he had. <coughs> Galileo had no theory uh, of uh, optics, no wave theory of optics, and indeed what he was seeing were not the true disks of the stars resolved in his telescope. He saw a, a, a diffraction pattern of the light entering his telescope and spreading out into these patterns. This is because the, of the finite wavelength of the light waves. If there was no diffraction, indeed they'd appear as two unresolvable dots in his eyepiece, no information about their size at all with his telescope. So, if my calculations of the distances are correct, I'm making this up, he never said this. Based on the observed sizes, I should be able to observe parallax over six months when the Earth moved to the other side of its orbit. But no observable parallax of these close stars, and we now know he grossly underestimated the distance of the stars because these were not the true sizes he was seeing. That was a diffraction pattern. And when you work out the true distance of, of these stars, and we can now measure the parallax with very precise instruments, it's five million astronomical units away, not 300 and 450. The distances of the stars are so great, it's almost impossible to see any uh, sort of parallax with only moving backwards and forwards by two astronomical units. So, we now know how far away the nearest stars are. The nearest one, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.3, uh, four, uh, four, um, 4.25 light years away. And if we were going to go there by car at 100 kilometres an hour, it would take 46 million years. If we were going to fly in an Airbus A380, tricky, no uh, air in the space, it would take 5 million years. Nowhere to refuel either. The uh, Pluto New Horizons mission to the object formerly known as the planet Pluto, now demoted, um, it would take 70... Uh, 8,000 years because this, uh, this uh, uh, probe was launched uh, from Earth at 58,000 uh, kilometres an hour and it picked up some more speed as we'll describe by slingshotting off Jupiter. Or indeed if you rode a beam of light from Earth to the nearest star it would still take you four years and three months and that beam of light travels at roughly one billion kilometres an hour. So ladies and gentlemen this universe is big and the nearest stars are not particularly near. So crossing this enormous gap is an enormous challenge. But there are plenty of destinations now. Uh, if you look up exoplanet.org, you can see a list of thousands of planets that we now know orbiting the nearby stars. Proxima itself seems to have a planet potentially orbiting in the habitable zone of warmth and light around its host star, only 4.2 light years away. And indeed, it's proposed uh, to make this the target of this Starship project with a 20 to 30 year flight time, supported by venture capitalists, cosmologists and the Facebook czar, the, uh, it's quite a, quite a crew, uh, to build this uh, fleet of nano spacecraft <coughs> propelled by a gigantic laser beam on Earth. And we'll come back to describe how this propulsion system might work. 100 gigawatts is not a trivial amount of power, by the way. There's also this newly discovered TRAPPIST-1 system, seven planets, three of which may be in the Earth-like habitable zone around the host planet. These are somewhat fanciful artist impressions, uh, but they all have very short orbits of just a few days, six days, nine days, or 12 days. Uh, so this is not a solar system like ours, where our uh, habitable zone is further away, our sun is brighter than the TRAPPIST-1 system and we go around, as you know, in a year. But these are very worthy destinations for closer investigation. 
And of course, on the wider stage, we orbit around the centre of our galaxy. The galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. It'd be nice to explore. And if we're feeling really ambitious, it's only 2,500,000 light years to the next galaxy in the constellation of Andromeda. The only problem with all of this, as you know too well, the human lifetime is a little short compared to even the travel time of light around our galaxy or outside of our galaxy. So we need to go fast if we're going to go anywhere in the human lifespan. So let me start by talking about some of the high speed matter that we generate right here in the School of Physics and in fact in Melbourne. I want to talk about some particle accelerators. A particle accelerator is really good for accelerating one atom at a time to very high speeds. So this is a helium atom with uh, two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus and surrounding it are two electrons in their quantum mechanical orbits. This diagram is not to scale. If I drew this to scale, uh, you could imagine uh, you were in St Paul's Cathedral in, uh, on Swanson Street and you saw a dust moat floating in the air. That is the nucleus and the cathedral itself is the cloud of electrons around it. That's the difference in scale between the nucleus and the atom that it hosts. Most of the mass is in the nucleus, only a little bit in the electrons. Now it's possible to tear one of those electrons off by blasting it with some radio frequency energy and now instead of a neutral helium atom we have a helium ion, a charged particle. It's then possible to put that charged particle inside the terminal of electro an electrostatic accelerator which is carrying an enormous positive charge. Like charges repel and so the alpha particle or the helium ion will then be accelerated due to the electric force. And here at the University of Melbourne we've been building particle accelerators since just a few years after the world's first particle accelerator was built in Cambridge in 1932. And so some of these machines um, were operated at quite high voltages, 200,000 volts. Then in 1947 a 1 million volt machine was built in the old physics building over towards the centre of the campus. Uh, another machine was built called the Statotron which is now in a, a warehouse in uh, Brunswick that belongs to the museum and today in the basement of the School of Physics we have the 5 million volt Pelotron. Now this is a quite a high performance machine, not like the one in CERN in Switzerland and France but nevertheless this machine over a span of just a few metres is able to accelerate a charged particle from zero to 10% of the speed of light over a distance of only 5 metres. That particle experience and experiences an acceleration equivalent to 10,000 billion times the strength of the Earth's gravity. So that's quite an acceleration. We like that sort of acceleration in physics. I'm not sure if we could ever apply this to a spacecraft containing people because they wouldn't withstand that sort of acceleration. But you get the idea that we, uh, we know how to make things go fast. This is a, a picture from one of my colleagues at the University of Florence. They have a system where they can take the fast beam of protons in their case out of the vacuum system of the accelerator through a very thin window and into the air of their laboratory. They use this for analysing uh, delicate works of art. They are, after all, the University of Florence. So this is what happens if you take a, a beam of protons, that is to say a hydrogen atom that's had its electron removed, travelling at 10% of the speed of light and allow it to emerge into the air. A lot of vigorous crashing is going on between the fast protons and the air molecules and this causes light to be given off. This, um, the fast protons experience friction as a result of this process and eventually they slow to a stop. They recapture a stray electron and turn back into ordinary hydrogen over the distance of about 10 centimetres. So if you're going fast, you should only do it in the vacuum because otherwise you will quickly dissipate your uh, kinetic energy through friction with the surrounding environment. Uh, down in the basement here uh, we are building uh, quantum computer chips as uh, Stuart mentioned. Here we have a small accelerator where we accelerate beams of phosphorus ions up to about a million kilometres an hour. Sounds impressive but it's just turn the knob on the power supply. And we then allow them to implant under vacuum 
into a silicon chip where they plough through the silicon chip and come to a rest about 20 billionths of a metre below the surface after the kinetic energy is dissipated and then as a result of the further steps we turn it uh, into a, uh, a device where we can harness the quantum mechanical properties of the phosphorus atom. Right, so much for accelerating beams of charged particles. Let's now talk about the real topic of this lecture, entering space. So where does space begin is the first thing I want to define. Well, according to uh, international conventions, uh, 100 kilometres above the Earth is the Kármán line defined to be the boundary of space. If you reach 99 kilometres above the surface of the Earth, you're only an aviator. If you reach 100 kilometres above the surface of the Earth, you are an astronaut or, or, or a cosmonaut or now a taconaut. But below that, you have no privileges of being called an astronaut. The, sh the space shuttle used to, and the International Space Station does, orbit somewhere around 400 kilometres above the Earth. And of course, by then, uh, very little of the Earth's atmosphere remains. If you're flying, uh, you stay no higher than uh, 10 to 12 kilometres above the Earth. In the case of the Concorde, uh, it went maybe 20 kilometres high. You can reach between 50 and 100 kilometres in a balloon before it bursts um, and uh, explore the uh, near space environment. And indeed, uh, one of my predecessors in the School of Physics, Dr Jean Laby, uh, she was our first uh, female physics uh, PhD graduate. Um, she had a very ambitious research program of flying high altitude balloons. Uh, here is a, uh, one of her balloons being launched from the roof of the old physics building. Some of you may recognise the Arts Clock Tower in the background. And thanks to an ingenious gas valve she developed, uh, these balloons could rise very high in the atmosphere without bursting. Because of course as the balloon goes up, the pressure goes down, the balloon expands and eventually bursts and returns to Earth. But not Jean's balloons. They could stay up for uh, extended periods of the time. And on the balloon, uh, on the instrument package suspended below the balloon, she flew Geiger tubes. This is one of her Geiger tubes and these were homemade in the School of Physics and count the radiation from cosmic rays that can be picked up once you get high in the atmosphere of the Earth. And she could, uh, some of her balloons went up nearly 100 kilometres to the edge of space thanks to her ingenious valve. Uh, eventually the latex would uh, perish and the balloon would burst and it would descend by parachute with the instruments uh, and here is uh, one of the instrument packages uh, with these aluminium reflectors so it could be tracked with radar and recovered. Often, of course, it would land in a tree somewhere way out in the, in the, in the sticks. And here are they, here's the team looking to figure out how to get this down. Uh, Jean took these instruments all around the world to South Africa and Brazil. Here's her uh, van. You notice it's the same van here parked out the back of the old physics building uh, being loaded off the uh, boat onto the docks in uh, Rio de Janeiro on an expedition she mounted there. And here she is in Africa having tracked the uh, descending instrument package and recovering it. I must say scientists were a lot better dressed in those days than they are today. <laughs> but uh, if you want to go higher than this, uh, you definitely need a rocket. So a long time ago when I was a young lad I was very interested in rockets and uh, uh, I had my own research program at uh, school, wasn't endorsed actually by the teachers, uh, but once a uh, vapour trail uh, from a rocket uh, rose out of the uh, patch of bush where I was launching them and it did attract quite a bit of attention. Anyway, um, these, uh, it was a very exciting time, it attracted a lot of attention from my colleagues when I was at school and I'm grateful uh, to the fact that you could uh, just walk into the Bailey Library and look up interesting topics in the old card catalogue and go up and have a look at the books on the stacks and no one would uh, stop you because you're after all engaged in the pursuit of learning and I learned a lot of useful things uh, from those books before I became a student here. Um, I'm taking this picture myself. I've retreated to a safe distance standing behind a tree because every now and then uh, this would happen and it pays not to get too close. <laughs> All right, so rockets. Why do we need a rocket? Because obviously balloons are limited by the boundary of the atmosphere. So um, this is why. If your 
vehicle is not capable of going faster than 28,000 kilometres an hour, it will rise out of the atmosphere of the Earth until its uh, uh, speed is expended in the gravitational potential well, and it will simply fall down again. As we all know, what goes up eventually, oh, sorry about that, my rocket was a bit uncontrolled, uh, comes down again. So clearly I did not throw that at 28,000 kilometres an hour because it simply followed a suborbital trajectory. However, consider this. Let's say I threw this uh, horizontally uh, at some good speed, a few metres per second. You notice that it followed a curved trajectory and curved back down until it hit the ground. Let me try that again, but this time I'm going to put a bit more oomph into it. Please be careful, the people down. I'm not a very good thrower. Okay? okay, I'm now throwing it maybe three times as fast. Ah, oh, stupendous. But you notice it still curved down until it hit the ground. Now, you could imagine in principle I get the wall out of the way and really give it a good throw. This time it curves down and hits New Zealand. I throw it harder still, it curves down and lands in Brazil. I throw it harder still, in fact I throw it at 28,000 kilometres an hour. As it curves back down, I take the atmosphere away as well so there's no friction. As it curves back down to hit the ground, of course we live on a spherical planet. This may be of some news to certain people in Canberra, but nevertheless we do. And so as the rocket is curving back down to intersect with the Earth, the Earth is curving out of the way. So in other words, if you threw it at 28,000 kilometres an hour, it would continually curve down to hit the Earth and keep missing because the Earth is curving out of the way and so it will go into orbit. Anything slower, it will curve down and hit the Earth. So this is a pretty significant uh, speed. If you are so strong you can throw it at 40,000 kilometres an hour, then it will escape the gravitational field of the Earth and head out into interplanetary space. These speeds are very fast. Keep it in mind when you fly, it seems pretty fast, but it's only a piddling 900 kilometres an hour, and there's no danger of your fast aeroplane going into orbit by mistake. <laughs> the speeds are way too slow. Throw rocket, I did. Okay. <laughs> this is um, uh, soon going, this is a rocket from uh, Branson's Enterprise, which will soon be taking uh, passengers for flights into space. Um, it's way too slow to go into orbit. You'll only have be in space for a few minutes before inevitably you fall back down and land. Um, so far, uh, the performance of this vehicle uh, is improving, but it's, uh, the speed and the altitude it's been reaching is actually very comparable to the late and much lamented Concorde. Uh, so uh, it's still got a long way to go, but it will never uh, uh, enter orbit. It will only uh, give you an experience of just a few minutes above the 100 kilometre uh, level, so at least you can call yourself an astronaut, even if you were there for only a few minutes. And of course, as you're falling back to the Earth, you will be weightless. Uh, not because there's no gravity, simply because you are falling. So if you want to reach orbit, you need a pretty serious rocket. And this is the late and also lamented space shuttle taking off that shows how it's done. We, uh, this is quite spectacular. Unfortunately, I, once I went to Cape Canaveral waiting patiently for a launch of uh, the space shuttle Atlantis, and it was all fueled up on the uh, pad ready to go, but they had a number of technical glitches and unfortunately I had to go to catch my flight and I didn't see it launch, but that would have been truly spectacular. Even just with the tanks fully fueled, uh, you weren't allowed to go closer than 10 kilometres to the pad uh, because of the uh, dangerous uh, situation. But obviously what's happening here is there's an enormous amount of exhaust pouring out the back of the rocket and in response to the, the exhaust going backwards, the rocket goes forward. Uh, here's uh, fuel being thrown away, here's a lot more fuel being thrown away in the form of the exhaust and after this later time the rocket has risen higher. 
But the total momentum of the rocket plus fuel system actually stays completely constant. So this is Newton. For every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So the action that drives the rocket upwards is balanced exactly by the reaction of the fuel going downwards or the exhaust from burning the fuel going downwards. Now to get the space shuttle into orbit the engines have to burn furiously and in fact according to the official NASA website at this point the space shuttle is genera generating over 37 million horsepower. Wow, nothing like the 21st century in the United States, hey? So <laughs> I've, I've converted that into proper units, 28 gigawatts. <laughs> well, 28 gigawatts, big deal, write it down. Okay, is that significant? Yes, 28 gigawatts! That's like half the entire electrically generated power with every power station, including Hazelwood, running absolutely flat out. So this is generating half the power of the whole nation of Australia for the few minutes that the main engines burn and the solid fuel boosters burn. This is an extraordinary amount of power. And all it's doing is conserving momentum, making the exhaust go down so the rocket goes up. Now, there's no way of breaking Newton's laws. So, let me show you a practical example. Steve, do we need to activate this uh, camera? Uh, what I've got here are two trolleys that are uh, connected by a very uh, powerful spring, um, which is compressed and held in place by this uh, string. Now, these two trolleys have the same weight, and I can easily set fire to the spring uh, and release this spring. Unleash the balanced force from the tension in the string and set it free. Well, excuse me just a second, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just close your ears for a sec. <coughs> Sorry about that. It's forbidden to set off the fire alarm. Uh, but you did notice the two trolleys recoiled symmetrically. The action and the reaction forces were completely balanced. Furthermore, if you're on some sort of land vehicle, you're connected to the ground. And you might ask, well, where is the reaction force in this case? So here I have a train. set up on a track which is on a bearing. And now if I set the train in motion, you'll notice that the track goes backwards in response to the train pushing itself forward. Again, we have an action-reaction pair. Normally, of course, the track is connected to the earth and the earth is very heavy compared to the train so it doesn't go backwards very much. In fact, you couldn't even measure it. But it's this, exactly the same principle. Now, this is the basis behind the way rockets work. But I want to show how I can propel myself through the lecture theatre using the rocket action. Steve, can we, uh, can we do this one? <laughs> All right, I need to get ready. So, if I have a trolley, very low friction trolley, and some reaction mass, hang on, some personal protection. <laughs> Boy, I don't know who used to wear that. The head was, hang on. And Steve has a nine kilogram medicine ball. Steve, launch me. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh. As you see, I'm recoiling as I uh, push the medicine ball away. Let's do two more. 
But it's very inefficient. <laughs> we need a way of throwing mass much faster. Thank you, Steve. OK, please cover your ears, people at the front. OK, so this is more like a rocket. Okay, that's, that's enough. My ears are ringing. All right, good. I've survived my rocket journey. A very <laughs> short one. Um, but you see the general problem. If you're going to go fast with this method, you've got to throw the stuff away at a prodigious rate. Steve, which button do I get to, uh, to uh, give us the... Uh... Okay. Train, carts, train, trolley. Yeah, good. <laughs> so we can do a calculation uh, at uh, how effective this process is, the rocket process. So here's a rocket to begin, fully loaded with fuel uh, with a mass m sub i. And over time, the fuel is consumed and the exhaust is uh, blown out the back. And as time goes by, of course, uh, the, the fuel that's yet unburned has to be carried along with the rocket. This is very inefficient. You're only carrying this fuel to throw it away at a later date. And so here we are at a small uh, further increment in time. The speed of the rocket again has increased as a result of the action-reaction principle. And here's the final step where all the fuel has been thrown away. The fuel tank is em empty. The uh, final mass of the rocket has been achieved and its final velocity. Now, this calculation was first done uh, back in the 19th century by a, a brilliant Russian who was very interested in uh, 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 launching rockets to the other planets. And here is his conclusion. It's also a simple problem for my advanced mechanics students in first year. So the delta V, the change in speed of the rocket, is equal to the difference between the uh, final sp speed and the initial speed. And if you launch a rocket from near the equator, and you launch it to the east, you can pick up an initial speed of 1,600 kilometres an hour just because that's how fast the surface of the Earth moves as it rotates once every 24 hours. So you can maximise this by uh, taking advantage of the Earth's uh, uh, revolution. And this is equal to the speed of the exhaust times the natural logarithm of the ratio of the initial mass to the final mass. This is the laws of physics which you can't break. So what does this equation mean for a rocket to go fast? First of all, you want to have the fastest exhaust velocity you possibly can. Throwing the medicine ball was not as effective as blasting a stream of uh, liquid carbon dioxide out the nozzle of the uh, fire extinguisher. And also it went out a lot faster than we were throwing the medicine ball. But you also have to maximise the initial mass over the final mass. So the final mass should be very light compared to the initial mass. In other words, most of the rocket to start with should be fuel. Now, with the best chemical fuels, you need to have a delta V of about 11 kilometres a second uh, to, to uh, escape from Earth. And when you use this formula, only 2% of your initial mass can be the airframe of the rocket. The other 98% has to be fuel that you're carrying along to exhaust and push you through space. So let's look at the best chemical fuels. The compressed carbon dioxide came out of the nozzle at 400 metres per second. Not bad, but if you go down this list, you look at burning liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, a fierce chemical reaction, the exhaust of which is simply water vapour, you can get an exhaust velocity of 4,500 uh, metres per second. And indeed, uh, the Saturn V moon rocket, the uh, first stage was uh, liquid oxygen and kerosene, and the second stage and the third stage were both liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, because this uh, is much lighter and it's good for throwing away later when you reach high into the atmosphere. However, 
If you just had a single stage, you didn't throw any of your rocket away, only 2% of the initial mass can go into orbit. And so that's impractical from an engineering point of view. So when this calculation was first done, Constantin was very depressed because he thought rockets would never be, could never be built using chemistry that would get them into space. Then he realised if you threw parts of the rocket away during the boost phase, this could get around this formula a little bit. And indeed in the Saturn V, all of this bottom bit is thrown away just to get this top payload into orbit, to get around the rocket equation. However, some exotic fuels uh, are, uh, are being examined, uh, rather dangerous. Instead of liquid oxygen, what about liquid ozone? Very unstable, very dangerous. Or what about splitting the oxygen molecule, O2, into two oxygen atoms and liquefying that? That burns really fiercely with liquid hydrogen. You can see you get a big boost in the exhaust velocity. Or, let's face it folks, chemistry is pathetically weak. There's no getting around it. <laughs> and if you want serious exhaust velocities, you've got to go nuclear. A 5 gigawatt nuclear reactor, heating the fuel, heating the, um, the reaction mass, it doesn't have to burn, uh, 10,000 metres per second, or a fusion plasma via some unknown physical principle might, might do the trick. Nevertheless, Elon Musk, a great visionary, is proposing a mission to Mars, riding only chemistry, with a new vehicle, his Mars vehicle, which will lift 550 tonnes out of the Earth's gravitational potential well using advanced fuels and advanced engines. He wants to send 100 passengers in this craft, uh, along with a pizza bar to keep them busy on an 80-day mission to the Martian surface. I'm amazed that he has the vision to do this, and I'm amazed he's got the money to do it, and I hope this is what he spends his money on, because I'd like to see this in my lifetime. I don't know whether I'd go. <laughs> but anyway, I hope it, I see the day. You can see it, the performance is enormous compared to the Saturn V, even though the rocket is of similar height at least, but a, a much greater diameter to carry the fuel. Oh, there's a red border around this one. Uh, it's interesting, this is, this is a hilarious movie really, uh, and did have some high level uh, scientific guidance. But when they land on this uh, watery planet in orbit, uh, tight orbit around the black hole, and they go for a, a paddle for some reason, um, they see this giant tsunami approaching and they jump back in the rocket, start the engines, and they just fly straight back into orbit. No, this is not going to happen because the rocket equation won't allow you to do that. So I'll say this is implausible, it's a single stage direct to orbit. No, unless, of course, the exhaust doesn't come from burning chemicals, it comes from a nuclear process, and maybe it does. In that case, why didn't they use it to take off from Earth in the first place? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> However, nuclear engines have been built. This is the Nerva rocket prototype in the 60s at the Proving Ground in uh, Albuquerque, in the Kirtland Air Force Base, turned upside down so it doesn't actually fly. It was sometimes called the Kiwi engine for obvious reasons. This had a small... Um, <coughs> Hundred, um, several hundred megawatt uh, nuclear uh, reactor, uh, uh, fissioning uranium in the traditional way, through which uh, hydrogen gas was pumped. The enormous heat inside the reactor heated the uh, hydrogen to enormous temperatures and blasted out the nozzle. But of course, passing your, your reaction mass through your nuclear reactor is a recipe for an engineering disaster and of course uh, the the reactor cores had to be incredibly strong and in fact not strong enough and in many cases uh, the reactor core failed and the, yeah anyway not a happy ending to this story. Um, but this was seriously proposed as uh, interplanetary uh, propulsion because of the enormous exhaust velocity possible with this uh, technique. So high temperature exhaust heated by a nuclear engine, I say plausible and potential for the new near future. I wouldn't like to launch it inside the Earth's atmosphere though. I'd loft it with chemical engines first, get it safely far away from the Earth before I turned it on. Or instead of um, uh, uh, heating your exhaust uh, with a nuclear reactor, take the concepts of the accelerators that I introduced at the beginning and use the iron beam itself as your propellant. Of course the iron beams that I use in my lab are only um, 
a, a few trillion uh, particles per second, but they emerge at enormous speeds. And so this is a, uh, the laboratory test of an iron engine. It uses uh, either mercury, xenon or cesium ions, positive ions, and a large electric field which accelerates the uh, ions to 145,000 kilometres an hour, a very respectable exhaust speed, but not much thrust because there are not many ions per second compared to a chemical rocket. But this was used on the Dawn asteroid mission in 2007. With the iron engine running at maximum thrust, it would accelerate from zero to 100 kilometres an hour in four days. So not exactly spirited performance, but they carried enough fuel for the engine to burn, well, not burn, the engine to run, uh, for 2,100 days. So even though the acceleration was tiny, they could build up enormous speeds in uh, comparison to the amount of uh, weight of the aircraft. And using electricity generated by sunlight meant that your energy mostly came for free. So this is a very nice technology uh, and uh, is used actually in uh, some commercial satellites to keep them on station in orbit around the Earth. But we can also pick up spare extra velocity around the solar system. Here is uh, one of the Voyager spacecraft about to undergo a head-on collision with the planet Saturn. The incoming velocity is 10.4 kilometres per second, from having come from Earth. Saturn is travelling in the opposite direction, hence the minus sign at 9.6 kilometres a second. The spacecraft whips around the back of Saturn and emerges out the other side with a speed of 30, nearly 30 kilometres a second. It's trebled its speed just as a result of this close encounter. Now how does this work? Well this is really simple kinematics. I can demonstrate it here in the lecture theatre. I don't have Saturn handy but I do have this basketball. And I don't have Voyager but I have this tennis ball. Now look what happens if I drop this tennis ball and have it recoil off the surface of the Earth. Oh, oh, very unimpressive. Oh, hopeless. But now, let me have it recoil off the planet Saturn, which will be travelling upwards at high speed because it too will bounce. And so I'll put Voyager, the tennis ball, close onto Saturn and watch the recoil now. Please, people in the front row, uh, you know, pretend you're on the centre court at Wimbledon, right? <laughs> Here we go. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Sorry about that. But that was a much more impressive recoil. That is, of course, I won't do that again because I think I violate all OH&S rules. <laughs> that's a much more, that's a very impressive difference between just bouncing the tennis ball off the floor. And there are lots of very fast planets nearby where you can uh, execute this manoeuvre and pick up some very handy extra speed. The Earth itself orbits at 30 kilometres a second. So a head-on collision in inverted commas with the Earth uh, will give you uh, uh, 60 kilometres per second should you choose to do that. And indeed some of the probes, uh, the Galileo probe, uh, did that a couple of times. Of course it's important that the trajectory of your probe does not intersect the surface of the planet and there will be no recoil in that case. So it requires very delicate uh, manoeuvring to make sure you get the maximum, maximum benefit. Yeah. And so indeed this is the Galileo probe in the clean rooms of the jet propulsion labs in Pasadena when I was a postdoc. Uh, it was just being uh, rebuilt after the shuttle disaster to harden it because when it was launched uh, finally on just an ordinary small rocket instead of the space shuttle it had to do a, a couple of slingshot manoeuvres off Earth, off Venus, off Earth, off Venus until it had enough speed to head for Jupiter. And now the atoms of this spacecraft are lost somewhere in the atmosphere of Jupiter because it was deliberately crashed at the end of its mission. So that was quite impressive. And uh, Pioneer and Voyager made use of uh, numerous slingshot manoeuvres and now uh, the Voyager craft, uh, the most distant human artefact from the Sun, uh, heading out uh, every year they increase their distance by three or four astronauts as a result of high speed and picked up from their numerous slingshot manoeuvres. In the future though, we might uh, let our imagination run wild and think of some more impressive ways of picking up high speed. Freeman Dyson is one of the world's most famous physicists, a very creative thinker, and 
between 1958 and 1965, he worked on a top secret project called the Orion Project, the idea of which was to send a, a human, uh, 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 I was going to say man, but start a star spaceship to Jupiter using 1960s technology. And here's the basic idea. You load your spacecraft with 300,000 atomic bombs of relatively modest mass. Then one by one, you throw them out the back and detonate them. The resulting blast will make your spaceship go very fast in the opposite direction. And indeed, this is a diagram from the now declassified report showing the G-forces after appropriate momentum conditioning, as they called it in the report, to prevent the astronauts getting flattened. The radiator, yes, the flattened mode. Um, as each bomb went off, a surge of acceleration, including allowances for misfires, the ones that can go off and recovering as it headed out towards the other solar system. One detonation, roughly. Uh, this, the story is now uh, available in this book by Freeman Dyson's son, George Dyson, who was just a child when his father was working on this project. And in the book, George, who was only uh, five or six years old at the time, knew his father was working on a top secret spaceship program that was going to go to Jupiter. And in the book it says how George asked his father that he'd like to come too. And when he designed the capsule, could he have a small chair next to the big chair where his father would be sitting so he could join them on their journey? Anyway, um, this uh, was shut down eventually, but it was uh, quite visionary and the, it's, uh, it would work. They tested uh, prototypes, uh, toy scale models with chemical explosives. And uh, at the end of the report, um, this 100,000 tonne spaceship, that's what you can do if you've got truly enormous amounts of energy, uh, could reach 3.3% of the speed of light by accelerating at the Earth's acceleration, uh, one gravity or 10 metres per second squared, for 10 days, which is quite an impressive speed and would really get you around the solar system or even to the nearest stars after only 133 years. Not bad. Also, what about using the most powerful fuel imaginable, antimatter? Total conversion of the propellant, antimatter, annihilating with ordinary matter makes light. It's 100% efficient. We don't know how this exactly would work. These cartoons don't give anything away of the technical details. And it's a very tricky storage problem because of the antimatter fuel in the tank came in contact with the normal matter walls of the tank. Actually, that's what you're going to be doing anyway. But it's a very tricky problem. I say this is not credible. Why not ditch the antimatter and just use the energy you were going to use to make it in the first place to power your spaceship? Oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, but uh, this is also implausible. You would need ultra high energy and volume exhaust if this thing was going to go single stage to orbit, as it does seem to in the movies. And in this picture, we see people waving it goodbye, looking straight into the business end of the exhaust. <laughs> This is extremely foolish. <laughs> Danger, fried people. <laughs> How about this one? The problem is carrying fuel. So instead of carrying fuel, why not burn what you find along the way? It turns out that outer space between the stars is positively stuffed full of matter. One hydrogen atom every cubic centimetre. <laughs> so this is a crazy idea generate a giant electromagnetic scoop which scoops up the interstellar hydrogen, funnels it down into a fusion reactor where it generates exhaust and propels your spaceship. I really like this idea, apart from its technical problems, because what you could imagine doing is feeding back the energy from the fusion reactor into the electromagnetic scoop to make it bigger. So as you get underway, and you start fusing the interstellar hydrogen, you start making your scoop bigger, and it scoops in more interstellar hydrogen. The reactor burns hotter, feed it back, makes the scoop bigger. More hydrogen, more heat, bigger scoop, bigger reactor, bigger scoop, bigger reactor, and you're pretty much right across the galaxy in no time. <laughs> but there are several serious problems. First of all, 
Hydrogen is a useless nuclear fuel. Most of the easy reactions between uh, protons, that is to say a hydrogen atom with the electron removed, are endothermic. That is to say they don't give off energy. So that's a downer. <laughs> so what could we use instead? Well, you know, the sun burns hydrogen in thermonuclear fusion, so it must work somehow, obviously. So let's use the reaction that powers the sun, one step of which is taking two hydrogens, fusing them to make a heavy isotope of hydrogen. One of the protons beta decays to make an anti-electron and a neutrino, which is useless and heads off to the edge of the universe without doing anything. But it does produce a lot of kinetic energy. It's an exothermic reaction, as our chemistry colleagues would say. Great! We're on our way. Not quite. Because of the need to decay a proton into a neutron, this decay can only proceed via the weak nuclear reaction, one of the four forces of nature. But it's weak. It's really, really, really weak. No, I'm exaggerating. It's really, 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 and I could be here for the rest of the year. Weak. Look how weak it is. If I took an ampere of protons, so imagine not an amp of electrons flowing through a copper wire, but an amp of protons, positively charged, flowing through a vacuum, that's a lot of protons per second, and piled them into a slab of solid hydrogen, really densely packed with protons, and let it run for 10 years, you would only get one of these nuclear reactions. This is an incredibly inefficient nuclear process. And in fact, the sun is an extremely feeble nuclear reactor. The sun burns with a heat not much greater than the heat I'm presently radiating out into space from the chemistry of the calamari I had for lunch at the University House. <laughs> the sun is only good because it's big. <laughs> feeble, but big equals good. So this is small and feeble. That equals bad. <laughs> Nevertheless, the artist's impression is quite impressive <laughs> and the maths is not quite convincing. Uh, Larry Niven proposes actually, okay, if the reactions are feeble, let's make our engine an entire star. And in his very impressive novel, Ringworld, this is exactly what he proposes, but I would say having your star as your engine is very dangerous. Or we can look out for inspiration into the cosmos. This is the strangest object in our galaxy, object SS433. It's 18,000 light years away. Optically, it just looks like a star. But when you look at the light that it gives off and pass it through a prism and look at the spectrum, it's extremely peculiar. The Doppler shift of some of the common spectral lines that you see in this spectrum wanders around all over the place on a time of 160 days. It turns out that this object is a normal star with a dead star, a pulsar, in orbit around it. And the whole thing is processing. And from the magnetic poles of the dead star, the pulsar, two jets of matter are emerging into the interstellar medium at 26% of the speed of light. This is an engine I would like to know more about. Unfortunately, we still don't 100% know how this works, but it might have something to do with Faraday's law of induction and some powerful quantum mechanics. Consider this, a powerful electromagnet, an aluminium ring. The aluminium is not magnetic, but if I turn on the electromagnet, induction <laughs> propels the aluminium ring off the electromagnet. Oh, that's okay. I think people can hear us and see it. If I increase the, uh, de uh, the um, volume of the aluminium, or if I put a really fat aluminium ring, it goes really well. And once upon a time I was allowed to do that again with the aluminium cooled to liquid nitrogen temperature and then it really hits the roof. <laughs> but when the frozen ring lands in the audience, it's not so good. Um, but we don't know exactly how this engine works. If we look out into space, we can uh, see it with the uh, very large array. This is the combined optical and radio image. You can see the, uh, uh, the star, the ordinary star, 
looking like a star in the middle and you see this strange cocoon which are the jets emerging into the interstellar medium and generating radio waves in this peculiar spiral pattern like a, a water sprinkler out of control but an ultra-relativistic water sprinkler. Still further, cosmic rays, protons from outer space, collide with the atmosphere of the Earth and we know from the energy that these protons have been accelerated to enormous speeds. We're not 100% sure, but again it's got something to do with oscillating magnetic fields around collapsing stars. Maybe we could harness this to go really fast. No, I don't know how that works. <laughs> or, let's use a very simple method. We take the fastest stuff in the universe, light. If you shine a beam of light onto a mirror, the light will be reflected. And in doing so, because light carries momentum, no mass, but momentum, thanks to quantum mechanics, when the, uh, proton, when the photon, when the light recoils, its momentum vector has to turn around. And by Newton, that means the momentum has to absorb the excess, uh, sorry, the mirror has to absorb the momentum to compensate. So the mirror picks up two units of momentum because the, a photon had one unit coming in and a negative unit going out and now we have a complete balance. So light itself will cause your spaceship to be propelled through space and in fact in the early days of the space program before microelectronics was well developed you could bounce radio signals off gigantic metallized balloons in orbit around the Earth above the atmosphere, just as a passive radio reflector. But these gigantic balloons launched into space by a, rec a rocket, put into orbit and then inflated, quickly drifted off their orbits simply because of the pressure of sunlight. And indeed the GPS satellites have iron thrusters to compensate for the pressure of sunlight shining on them. The Japanese have taken this to a high art. This is an artist's impression of a Japanese solar sail, very sophisticated, it uses reflected sunlight and it's got LCD panels embedded in the sail so it can steer using the tiny thrust from the reflected sunlight. And it's now way out in deep space somewhere, I'm not sure whether they're still in contact with it. So this gets my seal of approval because you don't need an engine, you just use reflected sunlight. Of course it's very slow, but it's free. Actually it occurs to me, um, I've got my, um, got my special, oh yeah, hmm. Okay, um, just, what happens if I just back onto here? Alpha Centauri, here I come. Okay, well this is only going to work with a very much more powerful laser than that, sadly. All right, finally I just want to talk about a few problems imposed by relativity. First of all, let's go back to 1969 when Armstrong walked on the moon. He went there in the Apollo 11, 11 capsule on display at the National Air and Space Museum. It's absolutely tiny. After he walked on the moon, he walked on the deck of the USS Hornet in his biological isolation suit and the sailors painted his footsteps. That's on display in San Francisco. Now, here is the effects of the finite speed of light just between the Earth and the moon. Please listen to this recording. This is a recording of Buzz Aldrin and then Neil Armstrong from the lunar module as they descended to the lunar surface. A lot of technical stuff, fully manual, no computer. Listen to when... Why did Armstrong delay between saying Houston, then uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. There's quite a significant delay between those two phrases. Thanks to the work of a guy who uh, made a fortune in the IT industry, he said, let's consider what Armstrong was hearing in the lunar module as it was descending on the moon <laughs> to allow for the fact that it takes 1.3 seconds for the radio signals to go from the Earth to the Moon and then from the Moon back to Earth. 
So he rearranged the recording to make this. All the technical stuff at the beginning. You see that? The words from the earth. The words from the earth overlapped with what he was started saying. Eagle and Houston, Eagle coming up from the earth from uh, mission control, Houston from Armstrong occurred at the same time and that's why he paused to hear what they were trying to say and then he picked up again and then we heard there was a delay until Earth acknowledged where it sounded like Earth acknowledged straight away <coughs> back on Earth. So this is the effect of the finite speed of light. It imposes communication difficulties even on the moon. This is another Hollywood movie. Uh, I looked at this spaceship, very impressive, but there's no obvious source of reaction mass, even though it's got a very impressive engine here. Mm -hmm. But more seriously, I don't know if you know the plot, without giving much away, there was a guy on this spaceship, a 90 year journey, but he woke up ten, uh, after only 10 years. And he was very worried about this because he didn't know how, go, how to go back to sleep again. So he asked the ship's computer to send an email to Earth to ask for advice. And the computer said, are you sure you want to do this? It'll be very expensive. Yes, I am sure. Send it. All right, I'm sending it. The computer sent the message. Reply expected in 35 years. <laughs> this is why it's important to teach physics to engineers by physicists. <laughs> With all due respect to any engineers who may be here. And this was the communication time delay that they, at least they got that part right in this Hollywood movie. Finally, the big three of relativity. Moving clocks run slow by time dilation if you go fast. Fast travel shortens the distance between points by the Lorentz contraction. And kinetic energy adds mass via E equals mc squared. There are all the technical details. The twin phenomenon can work to your advantage. Here are two twins, beautifully crew cut. One of them gets on this rocket, launches to a distant star, comes back, unknown propulsion system, and his Earth twin has now aged compared to him because he went fast and had the benefits of time dilation, so his biological clock ticked more slowly by relativity. Here he's gone on an even longer journey at higher speeds, and when he comes back, all known planning laws have been abolished, and this hideous postmodern monstrosity has replaced the city he left. But you might ask, well surely this is symmetrical, but the true, uh, why, does it, why is it the spaceship twin is young and not the Earth twin? Because from each other's point of view they're moving at high speeds. Well, symmetry is broken here. I can't give the full explanation without keeping you here till breakfast time. Uh, but the spaceship twin reverses his velocity vector in order to come back, whereas the Earth twin does not. And so that breaks the symmetry and causes the asymmetrical ageing. Now I'm going to Frankfurt tomorrow uh, to a conference uh, and I'm going to fly. I fly, this is my, um, I always take a Geiger counter with me. Uh, <laughs> lift off out of Melbourne, 10 kilometres above the earth, I'm exposed to the cosmic rays from space. There's no point trying to explain this to the person you're sitting next to, by the way. <laughs> Land in Singapore, take off again, up to Frankfurt, burn off the fuel, get very high indeed. Land in Frankfurt, all is good. So, that radiation comes from cosmic rays, fast protons typically, that uh, can't reach the surface of the Earth because of the atmosphere, fortunately for us. But some of these protons have been detected that are travelling at astronomical <laughs> speeds. In fact, they're travelling so fast their gamma factor is 10,000 million. That's the uh, degree to with which their clocks slow down. An enormous speed just slightly less than the speed of light because after all a proton is a particle. So such a proton, accelerated by means we know not, would cross from one side of the galaxy to the other in just 100,000 years because our galaxy is 100,000 years in diameter. But let's look at our galaxy from the vantage point of the proton which is sitting calmly at rest and it sees this very fast galaxy going past. The galaxy speed is just the opposite to the proton speed, just a little less than the speed of light. The gamma factor is 10 to the 10. So the width of the galaxy by the Lorentz contraction 
is 10 to the 5 light years divided by 10 to the 10 the gamma factor, that's 95 million kil kilometres or 0.7 of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. At the speed the galaxy goes past, it would only take 10 to the minus 5 years to go past, which is 5 minutes. So in other words, if you could accelerate your spaceship to have this gamma factor, you could pop out, have a look at the other side of the galaxy and be back in 10 minutes of ship time. Don't wait, because here on Earth, 200,000 years will have elapsed. <laughs> also, when you go fast, a phenomenon called stellar aberration means all the stars that are originally off to one side begin to drift into the forward view. And so pretty soon, once you reach very fast uh, relativistic speeds, approaching light speed, the entire universe disappears into a little point directly ahead of you. Navigation is quite a challenge. Also, those protons, those hydrogen atoms, one per cubic centimetre, will be raining down on your spaceship with this enormous gamma factor because of your relative motion. Even in Earth orbit, this is an astronaut's helmet from Apollo 8, the cosmic rays collided with the plastic and left tracks which could be developed and here are replicas of the fast cosmic rays colliding with the plastic. You are going to have to deflect this stuff away from your spaceship to avoid frying the passengers. But the very serious problem of energy is the big one. If you're in a car on the freeway at 100 kilometres an hour, your gamma factor is one, no time dilation to worry about. And at that speed, in every kilogram of your car, there is 400 joules of kinetic energy. A joule is the unit of kinetic energy. But even a slow proton moving at a thousandth of the speed of light from one of our small accelerators with a gamma factor that almost equals one has five by 10 to the 10 joules in every kinetic energy if you had a macroscopic lump of matter traveling that fast. A fast proton, 1 by 10 to the 16 with a gamma half the speed of light but only 1.2 is the gamma factor. An electron in the Melbourne synchrotron has an enormous amount of kinetic energy. The electrons are travelling just a tad less than, less than the speed of light, the gamma factor is 6 and there's 5 by 10 to the 16 worth of kinetic energy in every kilogram. And our cosmic ray proton with a gamma factor of 10,000 million, there is 9 by 10 to the 8, uh, 28 joules of kinetic energy in every kilogram of a spaceship travelling at that speed. Just for comparison, the Australian electric power for one year, uh, with everything running flat out at 45 gigawatts, every power station in the land would generate 1.42 by 10 to the 18 joules, 10 orders of magnitude less than even a spaceship weighing only one kilogram. Or in other words, you'd have to run Australia for 500 million years and accumulate the electrical energy into a ginormous capacitor to accelerate just one kilogram of matter to have this gamma factor. So there's no way I'm ducking out for five minutes and checking out the other side of the galaxy anytime soon. You would surely notice. And just to wrap up, there are some very altern exotic alternatives. Don't send humans, just send the instructions. Hope there's something at the other end to reconstruct them. Or maybe tap the energy of the vacuum lots of particle antiparticles flashing into existence and then annihilating again, but uh, implausible unknown physics. Take something really heavy like the USS Enterprise. It weighs 10,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 tonnes, powered by four, uh, eight Westinghouse reactors, 210 megawatts, crew of, of 6,000. Maximum speed, 55 kilometres an hour. So this is probably the heaviest thing that's under control. If you can increase that by 10 orders of magnitude, you can warp space and maybe open a wormhole. I'm not wasting my time thinking that's going to happen anytime soon, nor will that. Yes, yeah, not heavy enough in my view. And <laughs> even if it looked like that, it's still not heavy enough. <laughs> this gets an honourable mention because the aliens on this spaceship are fully versed in the concept of Lagrangian mechanics. That's a different way of looking at the world to Newtonian me mechanics, but if you want to know more about it, you'll have to take our advanced uh, second year mechanics course. I was quite intrigued by the premise. I, in talking to the people sitting next to me, they missed that. They just liked the beautiful spaceship. <laughs> Finally, a long time ago, there was this episode of inflation in the early universe, where the universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the 50 in a short interval. Well, if it happened once, maybe it could happen again. Equip your spaceship with a space deflating unit at the front and a space reinflating device at the back and away you go. 
Rather than transporting the spaceship, you transport the space around it. Uh, yes, unknown physics, I'm afraid. I haven't got time to say this. So anyway, just to the last slide, why are we doing all this? Well, you know, I really want to know whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. And as far as we can tell, the formula for life is liquid water, carbon and trace elements, plenty of power going in from a nearby star, and lots of time. And this gives you life. I don't know what's going on down here. Maybe that's necessary. Pro maybe not. Um, <laughs> if this is the formula, then there should be life everywhere, because there are lots of places where these things exist. So we must go to Mars to see if there's life there, because all these things existed on Mars in the early, uh, early life of our solar system. And of course, all those stars orbiting the nearby planets are just the nearby star all those planets orbiting the nearby stars are crying out to be investigated. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end. For the near, oh, for the near future, it's chemical rockets, iron engines and solar sails, possibly the first interstellar probe powered by sunlight. A relativistic spaceship? No, not within 500 years, I think. The resources of our solar system seem to be <laughs> adequate. So remote sensing is the answer for the foresee foreseeable future. But stay tuned for future developments. Thank you very much for your attention. Kept people a little bit late. Thank you. No, no, I have to, I have to, I have to stand. <laughs> On Einstein's memory, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. You cannot. I'm sorry, not in this universe. <laughs> Not possible. No, I, th I think I would need extraordinary evidence, and I don't think so. Maybe one more question. Speak loudly, please. Sorry, have you come across the space elevator? Yes, I have. So the idea is you put a, an object in geosynchronous orbit, 22,000 kilometres above the surface of the Earth, so it appears to stay in the same place at all times, and you lower a long cable which is possible if you're in a geosynchronous orbit, 22,000 kilometres long, and you can hoist things up and down without using rockets. Cable has to be very strong and very long. I'm not holding my breath on the space elevator. Uh, one. Of course there is always hope. And human ingenuity will rise to the occasion if only we knew what that stuff was. <laughs> and since we don't know what it is, we can't hand it over to the engineers to build a spaceship out of it anytime soon. But if we crack it, who knows? Could open up new possibilities. Good question. Thank you. Right, so before we uh, thank Professor Jadison again for his lecture, just remind uh, people hopefully to see a lot of you back here next week for um, our next the next instalment in our series of, of July lectures. So thank you again, Professor Jones.